everybody. Welcome back to the SFLC podcast. Want to give a big shout out to Steve Cazola coming on with his big victory at Bellator over the weekend. But we move right along and we're joined by Mr. Mike Pendleton from Chicago, Illinois. Mike, thank you for taking the time with us. It's always kind of interesting seeing uh, what your schedule is and my schedule is and Steve's schedule is. We kind of get everybody going at once. Well, for the sake of my job, I'm not going to say I'm at work, but you know, the timing, the timing, I always make it work. I, uh, I, I hear you loud and clear, brother. I will not say a word. Um, and then, of course, we also want to welcome on to our show for the first time another member of American Top Team. I feel like this gym's been giving us a lot of love lately, so I'm, I'm, I'm really appreciative of them. Uh, Phil Darrow, the strength and conditioning coach. Phil, thank you for taking the time with us this afternoon, and I'm glad to have you on for the first time on the SFLC podcast. Oh, man, I'm glad to be on. Thanks for having me. We were talking with Mike Brown earlier, and he was talking about all the fighters that American Top Team has. Your gym is one of the top echelon gyms in the world for MMA. But Phil, you didn't start in MMA. You were actually a uh, college football player and got your degree in, I believe, kinesiology, correct? It was uh, sports medicine and exercise science. Close, though. (laughs) <laughs> Similar. <laughs> Trying to get there. Exactly. So how did you end up getting that jump from college football and, and using exercise science and combining those two and transitioning them into the sport of mixed martial arts? Well, I don't know if you guys know this, but I also was a pro fighter for about eight years. Dean Thomas was my first coach after I got done playing football. So it wasn't a a too bad of a transition. I took some of the basics from strength training that we utilize in a sport like football, like any other strength power sport. I utilize those techniques, but then you also have to understand that MMA is a mixed aerobic system sport. So I have to make sure that I'm connecting these dots and making sure that everybody is getting what they need and we are uh, encompassing every aerobic capacity within the time frame that we have in a, in a training camp, which is, is some, is some points can be very uh, difficult because of the, all of the stuff that they're doing throughout the days and the weeks with all the skills training, you know, jiu-jitsu, wrestling, things like that, um, and then, you know, throw in strength and conditioning there. So my main goal really is to make sure we're managing fatigue and that we're progressing them so that they can peak right on time for their fights. So, I mean, utilizing proper periodization protocols that, um, you know, that we've learned, that I've learned, in, in not only in school, but primarily, primarily when um, I got out of school, you know, with uh, more just reading and, and actually understanding, you know, uh, proper periodization protocols from, you know, the old Soviet Union back in the day, you know, with all their stuff. I mean, primarily what we utilize as a strength coach is, is all the stuff from Russia, which is, it's funny to me because I go now to like Dagestan and I'm out there in Chechnya with a lot of these killers, you know, that, um, that fight. And, um, you know, they really don't know how to really train and you have to take the step back and, and show them that there is a proper approach to everything. You need to have a systematic strategy and, uh, it's not all about, you know, just throwing shit at the wall, trying to make it stick, you know? So that's primarily what I do is, uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm almost like a firefighter. I try, to, I try to put out fires and make sure that they're getting the job done, but also we're recovering properly so that they can train and, and do what they need to do on a daily basis. Yes, sir. So I, have a, um, so I don't know. A lot of people don't know this. Some people do. The first gym I ever walked into was your gym down in ATT. The first person I ever hit mitts with, or got lessons from was the same guy who started you off in Dean Thomas. Um, I, but I kind of want to take it through what the casual fan, because th- that was the first time I ever walked into a gym and was like, oh, this is a legit fight gym from everything, from the coaches to the sections of the gym to every, you know, every l- little inch in that gym is accounted for as a, one of the best gyms in the world. Um, and, and the casual fan will talk, will, will hear this conversation and they'll want to talk like things that only a casual fan can talk about, like 
how could Conor McGregor gas out against Nate Diaz when he's bigger? And all of this, so, like, if, if I'm using that example, and not to talk about a fighter that you don't work with, but let's just use fighter A, how, how do you go in and... Even with the you know UFC Performance Institute and everything that's available to all these fighters, what makes you different in the sense that hey, I know your limitations because there are limitations that some fighters can't get past. How do you take fighters to better their limitations and really just become better uh, physical freaks of nature? Well, I mean, everybody nowadays is kind of getting used to the notion of we need strength and conditioning for. MMA and combat sports in general, where before that, you know, it was kind of like a misnomer, like people didn't really want to lift weights, they thought they would get slow and sluggish. Now with the introduction of places like the UFC Performance Institute and, you know, people that are professionals now that really have the science backing are coming into the sport and really truly understanding what they need to do to get these athletes better. You know, for me, my, my whole thing is you have to make sure that you collect data we have to make sure that we're getting proper assessments done. And then from there, you can, you know, correlate what they do through each training session throughout the weeks. So I guess the thing that you could say that sets me apart, though, is that I know how these fighters uh, feel and I know what they go through on a daily basis because I've been through it myself. I was actively um, competing in MMA since I was 20 years old. And um, I understand how it feels to weight cut. I understand how it feels to be dead tired and trying to go and do another training session. <clears throat> and then as far as like the mental aspect of the game where, you know, you wor you're worried about how to perform on, on the time when you need to be. You know, every, every training session, if you don't do your best or you feel like you haven't put forth your absolute energy, you feel like it was a waste or that you're not going to be prepared for the fight, all these things go into fighters' minds throughout the days and throughout the weeks of, of a training camp. And um, that's why I can connect. Uh oh, did I lose you? Hello? Hey, sorry, Phil. I thought I lost you for a minute. You cut off there. Okay, where did where'd where'd we end up at? Oh, it was just a few seconds ago. You were talking about um, the concept of you knowing what it's like to be dog tired from a fighter and and, and yeah uh, i mean well sure so like yeah i mean just just to connect with these fighters on, on that in that way you know i think that that helps me out a lot and then knowing you know several different demands of the sport and and truly knowing the ins and outs especially when it comes down to even transitioning over into the skills training when it comes down to physical preparation i know exactly what muscles work what for what type of uh, style or what type of art. And then I know how to actually translate that over to where they're actually going to improve from a performance standpoint um, to benefit them in their specific skills and training and tactical work that they do. I mean, I guess that, that pretty much sums it up for me. Now, Coach, you were talking a lot about how there's specific ways that your muscles uh, get engaged for a fighter as perhaps... Uh, other sports, such as most notably football. So we know that there are dozens of weightlifting uh, regiments that exist in the world of football and baseball and all that. But there isn't necessarily that definitive weightlifting program in mixed martial arts. Or is there? Well, not yet. I mean, for me, I don't think that the perfect program is probably ever going to be out there. It's not one one size fits all, especially in a sport like MMA, where it's strictly individualized. And even with the systems that I, you know, um, I have several programs and several systems that I utilize per individual just because, like I said, not one size will always fit, you know, every one. So we want to make sure that we are, you know, uh, directing them in the right way and uh, the line's got to connect like I said before so there is no one workout or one training but the one thing I can say is that you have to make sure that you're stimulating aerobic capacities you're working on strength and power and then from there you want to work on maximal speed and then your conditioning has to be on point from a from a um, from a skills perspective so they have to be able to do you know their job or their you know their their sport in a sense as efficiently as possible without getting tired, especially during training camp. 
Of course. <laughs> and I think that's kind of where the sport of mixed martial arts is unlike any other. You were talking about having to have conditioning, almost like we're talking about a distance runner, as opposed to having speed drills like you're a sprinter. Very few fe people are mm -hmm. both, you know? So I, I, I guess that's where your position comes in being very uh, necessary, is, is finding that perfect blend of speed meeting conditioning and then power meeting agility. So I'm not going to ask for a specific fighter, but let's say that one of your fighters comes in eight weeks out, full fight camp, and, you know, they have, what, 19, 20 pounds to lose, but they also want to be at their best physical condition. What's going through your mind when the fighter first comes over and says that to you? Do you already have a game plan in motion, or are you kind of just building on what we have seen from that fighter in the past? Yeah, well, like I said, you have to collect data, so we have to get the needs analysis. We have to get a full assessment done, and that's a physiological assessment, a fitness assessment. And then, you know, something along the lines of getting a DEXA scan done to see where their body fat lies, and we can correlate that with the weight cut. And then from there, you know, see how much muscle mass they have on them, how strong they are, you know, um, where they want to improve upon, what type of fighter they are, actually. You know, if I have a guy like a Tyrone Woodley who's totally different than somebody like a Dustin Poirier, because one guy is predominantly fast switch, the other guy is predominantly slow twitch, one guy's going to have more benefit doing certain things than the other. So we got to make sure that we are closing gaps, in a sense, and trying to make sure that we are encompassing full circle on um, what they need, especially coming down, you know, closer to the fight. But if I had a guy eight weeks out, or girl, whatever the case may be, um, like I said, I want to get a full assessment done. And we do that usually around nine weeks out. So then when we start camp, they're ready to go. Half the time, a lot of my people that I work with are on an out-of-camp program or a protocol that they use that are, that are gonna, it's going to enhance their, their work capacity, their general physical preparedness, get them ready to start camp because I don't want them coming into camp out of shape. I want them to actually have, you know, they're almost there, not completely there, but almost there. I would say around 70, maybe 75%, you know, starting in camp. This way they can go full go when they need to. We deload them halfway through, about five weeks out is usually when I see a drop off so that on the four weeks out, we can get a super compensation effect. And then from there, we just go ahead and taper off the two weeks and peak them right when they need to because the end of it, and a lot of my guys and girls fight in, you know, bigger promotions, so they're gone, you know, the week before the fight. So I, I see them maybe, you know, the last day I see them is going to be a week before. So I want to make sure that we're getting that end of camp assessment see exactly how much we improved and then uh, and then just be ready. You know, a lot of that goes into um, psychological benefit too as well. If they see, and I know they are going to see uh, increases in overall performance, um, they're going into the fight knowing that they've done everything they possibly could, especially from my point of view, from a physical preparation standpoint. Um, they're ready. They're capable to perform at their peak, and all they have to do now is worry about their weight cut, and usually we have guys in line for that. So... That's a, that's to sum it up for you guys a little bit. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm ready to I'm ready to come back down to Florida right now. I'm sick and tired of looking like a 12 year old boy. Uh, but I kind of taking what you do and, and your background. I think before you got into this line of work, um, I'll, I'll talk about one of uh, your fighters down at your gym, uh, Greg Hardy. Um, I'm not bringing up Greg Hardy's past. I'm bringing up Greg Hardy, the athlete, the fighter. How, what has been your biggest challenge or maybe the, the one thing you have an upper hand in uh, with him, whether it's working with him or talking with him and the sense of that football background? I guess my biggest question is because we're seeing this jump a lot where former football players, whether it was in college or in the NFL, get into mixed martial arts. What is the – do they have a benefit coming from professional football or collegiate football into mixed martial arts? I would say they know how their body, they know their body very well. So Greg is a perfect example of that. He knows what he needs to do to get better. Um, very respectful. Like people really don't understand. I'm not trying to bring up his past or even, I've never had any problems with Greg whatsoever. And the good thing about it is that we can connect because we come from that football background where, you know, like a team sport approach, 
where, you know, you're held accountable. You know, you have certain roles that you need to play as far as the team goes. And we try to image ourselves as a team, even though it's an individual sport, we are American top team. So we want to make sure that we're there for each other. Um, but whenever I ask, you know, him how he's doing and things like that, he's he's 100 percent accurate with what I would feel he'd be feeling. So he's not usually lying to me. That's a good thing. So he, he stays honest which is uh, something of a struggle sometimes with a lot of fighters that that really haven't been in a sport before. They just just automatically just started fighting. Um, they, they adopted that kind of warrior mentality or, you know, hard-headedness, I would say. And uh, we're, we're trying to, you know, limit that as much as we can. We're trying to make sure that they're acting like true professionals, just like Greg does, man. So I, I, I do appreciate something like that. And he's highly athletic. The only thing we really have to hone in on is his skills and his skills in the sport itself. Um, and then from there, just a little bit of conditioning. I mean, he's a big guy, very strong, very powerful. Um, mobility and conditioning would be something that we always want to, you know, improve upon just because of where he's coming from and what type of person he is as far as from an athletic standpoint. And we can improve upon that as we go further, knocking guys out in the um, anyway, so it really doesn't matter at this point. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, the, the, let's call it limited skill set he has right now is, is proving to be more than enough at the next level, and, uh, and I'm really excited to see where he goes as a fighter. Um, you know, I mentioned that you guys were the first gym I ever walked into, and it was state of the art. You know, it was, I, I walked in on a, on a Lamborghini gym, um, you know, it, it was incredible. For, for me, when I hear you talking about these things, I won't mention other gyms, but there are other gyms, we'll call them top gyms in the world, that I can walk into, and I wouldn't have all the resources. I wouldn't have all the coaches. Maybe they have all the right equipment to get a fighter right, but they don't have all the equipment or the trainers or the coaches to get an athlete right. So what do you think really separates American top teams from everybody I think that, you know, it doesn't even have to do with uh, the amenities and the, you know, how big our facility is or anything like that. I believe that it is the fighters that we have there. Um, you know, iron sharpens iron, and we have the top, without a doubt, some of the top fighters in the world, not just in the UFC, but, in, like, in general. Um, we have, I, I train over 30 to 50 fighters that are usually in the UFC, Bellator, in the big promotions. And they all have, you know, something to bring to the table. So everybody's getting better with the partners that they have. Us as coaches, we come from fighting backgrounds, all of us. So we know how it feels and we know what we need to do to get these guys ready, especially at the higher levels. And most of the guys that, that's, that's coaching have fought at the higher level. So that's even better. So I think that it's, it's a mix of, you know, the, uh, the talent that we have as far as fighters go. And then the cohesiveness between the team and the coaching staff, which really sets us apart. And coach, you were talking about a few of your athletes, obviously Greg Hardy, uh, a great example of somebody who's transitioning, like you had transitioned. But obviously we have UFC Fight Night uh, in Calgary that's coming up at the end of the month. And you, sir, have been posting quite a bit of some work that you've done specifically with Joanna Janjacek. And then also showing some stuff with Dustin Poirier. Uh, you were working with Tyron Woodley last year. Uh, but leading into Calgary, how has Joanna really taken to the strength and conditioning side of this following her loss with Rose? I mean, we've always had a good relationship, me and Jay. I think that when she started at American Top Team, she really didn't do a lot of strength and conditioning. So I had to make sure that we eased her in with a lot of things. But now, now we've uh, we've developed a system, and I know exactly what she needs at certain times. You know how she's going to feel at certain times throughout the camp, and uh, she's taking a liking to it. She she likes to train. She likes to work out. She likes to do strength and conditioning. She feels her body getting stronger, feeling more powerful, more stability. She's already lightning fast with her strikes. It's just giving her the ability to do it for a longer duration, which is repeated sprint ability that I utilize and also, you know, increasing overall force production through higher amounts of strength training, but also making sure because she has to make weight, we don't put on too much muscle. Um, but, you know, that's that's getting deeper into the stock. 
things. But all I can say is that we decrease rate of force production, which will also enhance explosive power. And then from there, she just utilizes that speed to make it happen. Now, the good thing is that we are very uh, knowledgeable with her opponent coming in this fight here. Um, Tisha, I've actually trained as well. And pretty much all the coaches have trained her. You know, so, I mean, we have a good uh, good idea of what, you know, Tisha is going to try to the table. And so that we can negate that with our means of uh, preparation. And how about Dustin Poirier? I know that you've been more focused with uh, Joanna, but he's looking uh, very fight ready to go up against Eddie Alvarez um, in the 155-pound division. Has he been able to take to it the same way that Joanna has? Oh no! I mean, now let me let me just uh, re, you know I want to say first and, first and foremost, there's no one person that I'm actually you know paying more attention to. It's I'm I'm, I'm paying attention to all my fighters, um, but Dustin for sure. I think that Dustin's taken to me and, and to strength conditioning without a doubt, primarily more than any other of my fighters that I had. You know. Um, I've been training Dustin now for three years straight, and you can see a tremendous increase in his overall power, his strength, and his, and his body looks different. If you look at his, his body now than when he fought, you know, obviously he fought at 145, but even when he started at 155, you know, three years ago roughly, you know, we put on a good amount of muscle on him where the weight cuts a lot easier. He's stronger. He has more structural integrity. He's able to produce more power. And he's already have he already has a crazy gas tank, so I I, I, I take him I take him um, I want to say I hold him close, you know what I'm saying? Because at the end of the day, I know that he can be a champion, and he knows he can be a champion, and it's only a matter of time, and we need to put the things in place, you know, to do so. And obviously, higher you know higher things are going to come of that as far as. You know, he's got to beat Eddie, obviously. We know that. But then, you know, the whole thing with Connor and, and Habib, and, and we got to see what plays out there. But if everything's aligned and we do our job, we should get a title shot and we'll have a, we'll have a belt around his waist, you know, by, you know, 2000, 2019, somewhere around there at least. I love hearing that. Uh, Mike Pendleton, I know that you had another uh, question for Phil. Yeah, so in, in what you do, uh, I, I know we're seeing the results in Dustin, and, and you just talked about Joanna. I'm curious from, from your standpoint, maybe you could break down a little bit for us uh, simple-minded people, uh, how to understand the difference. And so Dustin went from 145 to 155. The challenge is there. And where do you stand on Joanna? possibly? Everyone says, oh, she needs to go to 125. She needs to go to 125. And where do you stand on, on those two and the difference in maybe moving up 10 pounds? Well, yeah, I mean, for us, him, you know, Dustin make the switch to 55. He enjoys training a lot more. He doesn't have to worry about the weight cut. All he has to worry about is his performance each and every day. Um, and he's enjoying the process a lot more. Um, and it's not in the back of his mind that he has to make weight, which is another thing that plays into a mentality of a fighter, um, especially during camp. All right, but as far as you want to, you know, I believe that, yeah, 125 would be a better look. People don't know that Yuan is a very, I'm not, she's not, I'm not just trying, to, trying to say she's a big girl, but um, she's definitely big for the weight class. You know, um, she's thick in the legs. You know, she does have a longer body type. She's like 5'6", five, 5'7". Five, she, she's, I mean, she's damn near, you know, one of the bigger girls in the gym. You know, and that's and that's saying a lot because we do have Amanda and we have you know other 135ers too. But I think that once you can you know stop worrying about weight cutting and start worrying about performance, and then you stop worrying about having to eat a certain way and you know being a calorie deficit throughout your entire training camp, which does decrease the the rate of recovery. And then from there, if we don't recover, then we can't train as much. We can't train as much. We can't get better. And then we don't, you know, we're, we're just playing, you know, we're playing a role here where we have to do what we can at, this, at times where we can't just progress. And the problem there is that, you know, at the, at the end of the day, we want to make sure that they're progressing each and every day. But if we're playing against a uh, weight cutting issue, then that's a problem. But, 
you know, we get the job done. I think that she does what she needs to do. She understands her body, which is really good. She works with George Lockhart, which is awesome. You know, um, me and George converse, you know, each, I would say, every other week. And um, we have a good understanding of what we need to do to get her weight. She needs it. And, and she's a monster, man. She trains hard all the time. Like, we have to pull her back constantly because she just wants to train and get better and, and, and be a champion again. And I think that once, like like I said, all the pieces are in line, if we can get that title back, that's going to happen. So this has all been great and informative stuff. I think the hardest question I have here for you is, Dean made me believe that I could actually punch something and it would hurt that other person. Um, but walking around, my, my state of Illinois license says that I am 5'8", 145, but yet everyone confuses me as a 12-year-old. So how long, this million-dollar question, would it take for me to have to work with you to actually look like a 26-year-old grown man? Oh, man. I mean, listen, we're playing against genetics here, man. I can do my work. Uh, I'm a miracle worker, brother. I got, I got to have time, you know what I mean? You got to put time in consistency. Listen, anybody can do it. I, and I'm going to get a little bit on my motivation side, but anybody can do this shit. You know what I mean? The problem is people don't want to They get motivated, but that doesn't mean anything if you don't follow through. So at the end of the day, you have to find your goal of what you want to do, put that to the side, and have little goals to accomplish the big goal at the end. Make sure that you're consistently working towards the end goal with little goals to be accomplished throughout that time frame. And that, if that does what it needs to do, then yeah, you'll get to where you want to be sooner than later. But uh, then again, we're also playing with genetics and you do look like a 12 year old, so I don't know how to, how to work that out. You know what I mean? <laughs> Well, you know, we, we well, can't. I, oh, go ahead, Mike. I was going to say, I, I can do uh, with what I have. Um, but no, your, your motivation is, is, is definitely right. I, I like that. I like the little goals, the big goals thing. I, I, I actually love that. Now, we do have to put Dean on blast a little bit because uh, we, we were talking and, and Dean needs to do some work with strength and conditioning and a little bit of weight management as well, doesn't he, Phil? All right, now listen, I've known him for roughly almost 10 years now, and I've seen him fluctuate in weight, but now it's consistently going up. I think he's eating too many uh, grilled cheese sandwiches and, uh, and uh, bologna sandwiches over there. I know, I, know he likes, I know he likes hot dogs for some reason. I think he likes hot dogs. Um, he's eating a ton of that. I think we need to stop that. I know he likes donuts, um, but... <laughs> To his defense, to his defense, he has been trying intermittent fasting, and he is doing it consistently, like I said before. And hopefully, this can bring him down. Now, as far as strength conditioning goes, Dean will never pick up a weight a day in his life. He may, he may pick up a, a Coke can, he may pick up a beer bottle, but he's not picking up any weights. Trust me. <laughs> maybe, maybe he needs to work with Lockhart over there. Maybe he, can, maybe Lockhart can help him out with that. Oh, well, listen, we tried that, too, and he, and he has his own diet. And ask him about it when you see him. It's called the Dinero diet, where basically what he does is he eats uh, fried chicken, and, and he also eats onion rings. <laughs> um, and after that, that puts him in a calorie deficit because he's only eating one time a day. So that may work because you're in a calorie deficit, but at the end of the day, he still looks like he's eating pork rinds every other day. His pores are killing me, you know. Um, but, but listen... But I know he looks very young. He's still very young. I mean, I think he's reaching about 55, I want to say. But, uh, but he looks about 36. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad he's still keeping his youth with all that, you know, with all the Kentucky Fried Chicken and Popeyes that he likes. <laughs> well, Coach, we uh, obviously love all the feedback. And it's always good to be able to take shots and, and, and have some fun. With, with the other guys from the team. Again, you guys have been great with us. Um, but before we let you go, Mike, uh, did I miss anything? I know that you – I kind of threw this on you at the last no. second, Phil. <laughs> I, I actually have one that he just mentioned in his roast of Dean Thomas that um, I know I've heard Kevin Lee say it, and I just kind of want to get your uh, take on it. 
how do you feel about fighters and lifting weights? Like, is weight lifting? I know we just did a whole interview about it, but how do you feel about guys or, or just anybody in general, fighters or not, that don't lift weights but find other ways to work out? Listen, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to sit here because I'm the strength guy and say that you have to lift weights. I mean, a lot of the times you can get strong by other means of training, but it, the only way to improve maximal strength is to move heavy load. So you have to get stronger by putting more external load on your body and being able to lift it. Um, if that's your goal, if you're, if you're weak as shit and that's something that you need to improve upon, then lifting weights will help your game. You know, it, it, it come do it the wrong way. You don't have a professional that's looking over your systems. So if you do have a coach and they know what they're doing, I suggest you go talk to them and look into lifting weights properly to help performance instead of just going into a, you know, a gold's gym and doing whatever you want, you know, doing a buys and tries workout. Cause I guarantee you that's not going to translate over into the fight game. Oh, absolutely. And I think that was probably one of the, uh, the, the biggest things that I was uh, looking forward to and that we were able to discuss in uh, this, this little uh, three-way discussion was being able to talk about weightlifting as it pertains to MMA, not just weightlifting as it pertains to strength. Because, of course, when you lift, you're going to be strong, but strong won't always translate into being a good fighter. No, not at all. But like I said, if um, but strength can increase power, obviously. Strength can increase your conditioning, and it also can increase the, um, well, I should say the reduction of the risk of injury. So those types of things do come into play, especially when you're talking about a, a high-impact sport, a contact sport like MMA. So, um, you know, if... If you don't have, like I told you, if you don't have somebody that's actually a true professional that can watch over you, I would search for somebody and don't just go ahead and do whatever you want. You know? So that that's one thing I will say. I'll throw that out there. Um, and then, you know, like I said, if you want to work on things that are going to get you stronger from a skill-specific or a sports-specific um, realm, I would say, you know, wrestling and grappling in the gi. You know, doing jiu-jitsu in the gi will definitely help your isometric strength. It will help your core stability. Um, wrestling the same concept um, as far as striking goes hitting the pads hitting the heavy bag will actually help you increase your power output um, things like that your speed <clears throat> timing and then um, as far as like other means of not lifting weights if, if you wanted to work on just maximal speed as far as sprinting goes not that it correlates over to the fight game but if you want to increase your speed your lower body speed just to be more elusive in the cage then yeah, you can do something like a track protocol or even gymnastics you know, to help with uh, overall body awareness and, um, and being more elusive and fluent into, in, in your fight, in your fight skills and, and, and into, the, uh, into the competition itself. Excellent. Now, Coach, one more question before we kind of wrap things up. And I, I've always enjoyed this question. Being somebody who works with a fighter, if or with all of the fighters that you work with, if there was one exercise that you love to put all of your athletes through, which exercise would that be? Okay, so people that know me and follow me on social media are already going to know what I'm going to say, which is the Zercher Squad. And the reason why I say the Zercher Squad is because it's very... It's very sports specific as far as you know, the the trans transition into the sport itself because of where the bar is placed. It's easily done and it doesn't have to. It doesn't take a whole lot of technical efficiency. It is uh, very safe to do where you're not putting axial load on the spine, and it's also teaching the athlete how to actually do a proper squat because you have a counterbalance with the barbell and. Lastly, you're working muscle groups that will increase the strength of your work inside the cage. What I mean by that is it's going to help with takedowns. It's going to help with takedown defense. It's going to help with striking. It's going to help with a lot of things because you're working the entire body with this compound movement. So, um, but yeah, so to answer your question in a short, 
it's the Zurcher squad. And is there any, a follow up to that, is there any exercise that you have your fighters do that they unanimously hate you making them do? Everybody hates prowler pushes or prowler sprints. That's, that's one thing that people will definitely go without. And, uh, it's one thing that I will not go without. So you're that, if you if you train with me, damn sure believe you're gonna hit some prowler sprints or some prowler marches or some sort of a uh, prowler movement. And what a prowler is is basically a sled with two handles where we can stack weights on, you know, um, to as heavy as we want it. And uh, on the warning, it has a it has a disclosure on the warning that if uh, if you do throw up or pass out, it's not on them. And it damn sure ain't on me because you signed a waiver as soon as you step in American Top Team. So, Fowler pushes for sure, um, hands down, nobody really wants to do those. But they're very beneficial as well. Outstanding, Coach. Look, we really appreciate you taking the time with us and, you know, giving us uh, an in-depth look at how there's several pieces to this puzzle that creates a whole packaged fighter, you know, from the striking coach to the wrestling coach. Uh, to the strength and conditioning coach, to the nutritionist. Uh, and that's why the fighters always say, you know, I wouldn't be here without my team, because it really is a team. You know, you guys spend countless hours with these fighters, and it, it shows in the ring. You know, they, they show it in the ring to you. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. I think, uh, you know, without a team, and without, without a team that has a good plan, you, you definitely plan to fail, and you have to have a team around you that's knowing of your goals and what you want to accomplish. And everybody has to be, you know, cohesive in their approach. And that's where the lines of communication come into play. And once you have that and you have a solid set mind and you know where you want to be, uh, sky's the limit for sure. All right, Coach, before we let you go, uh, we know that you're with American Top Team, but we also know that you're working with several people. So take the time to let everybody know where they can find you personally, if they have questions about their own strength and conditioning, if they want to join your American Top Team, let everybody know where to find you on social media and everywhere that we can find you. Yeah, sure. So I take a lot of questions on social media, especially on my Instagram. You can DM me. Uh, my, my Instagram is at Daru Strong, D-A-R-U Strong. My Twitter is at Daru Strong. Um, I also have a YouTube page out that I do put a lot of content on out there. Um, just search Phil Daru, you'll see me there. And then um, my website, uh, www.darustrong.com. And uh, yeah, so that's what I'm doing, man. And if you ever want to uh, get any online programming or any type of training, I definitely have programs out. And all you have to do is just email me. Um, you can email me, phil at darustrong.com. And uh, that's it, man. Phenomenal stuff there from Phil Daru from American Top Team. Always interesting to get that outside perspective. There's so much that goes into the fight game that we look past when we end up seeing fighters fight. We forget that there's a huge team that contributes to the success of every individual fighter. But just like that, we are out of time. We want to thank Phil Daru and Steve Cazola for joining us on the show today. Stay tuned as we'll have more coming up with Mike Pendleton, Mike McAllister, Stephen Dunn, and of course myself, I am Ryan Sprague. On behalf of the SFLC Podcast, thank you for tuning in, everybody. <laughs>